I have a company called Bionic Health, and we're launching a product called Nomad at, uh, at uh, uh, startnomad.com, where part of healthcare or health is social, a lot of it is local, right? So part of our concept is, you know, wherever you are, you want to be able to find the healthy foods and restaurants, the gym, the local running path. I'm arriving from Paris, from Palo Alto. I don't know what I could do here in some ways. How to put health in a contextual form and also be able to share that with your friends and colleagues and potentially even your medical team. And now we're in this era of big data, connected devices, genomics, how to integrate that into something that's useful, uh, not just lots of data. So I'm a physician, my team are IT folks, and we have user interface folks and design folks. You know, I like to give the example of technologies that were almost invented here at, at, Le, at Le Web, Uber, right? Uber is only four years old, it's worth maybe $40 billion. It didn't invent the cell phone, GPS, mobile, online payments, limousines or taxis. They layered it up in a smart way that makes people want to use it because it's less expensive, less stressful, and the payments are taken care of, and you get awareness of where the cab is with the cars that same sort of sensibility is starting to come to healthcare. In fact, there are several companies that are building kind of Uber apps where the doctor will come to your house after you press a button. Now that's a bit on the extreme, but those blendings of user interface, insight, locality, um, feedback loops, ratings, are starting to come to healthcare. So the consumer is the new empowered, you know, the new drug is the empowered consumer. You own your own health information. You know which pharmacy is going to charge what for the same drug. Which doctor down the street will likely give you a better outcome for the surgery you need. And so uh, I think the blending of, of local social feedback loop information, smartly you know, accessible through your mobile devices, is starting to shift healthcare. It's often called digital health or connected health. Physicians don't like to be uh, compared. This transparency is a very painful element for hospitals, for pharma companies, for, for all sorts of individuals. But we're now in the era of Yelp and, and all sorts of online rating systems. And part of that can help hold individuals accountable, right? You don't want to just go to a physician who's got a good bedside manner. Ah, good to see you. You want someone who's got good technical skills as well. And those who will end up uh, succeeding and being the ones folks will go to will both have the personal skills and hopefully the, the technical skills and they will be blending that with new technologies like IBM Watson artificial intelligence to help augment their skills or can take technologies like you know Google Glass which is being used especially in healthcare when I see you I can look at your medical record I can ask questions about the data I can record someone can be recording our visit all these sorts of tools can enable the, the patient and the clinician I am definitely not a transhumanist. That's actually a term I don't personally like very much. I think, in a sense, we're already transhumanists because we're using our smartphones as our portable brains, or you know, if you have any sort of orthopedic implant, you're a transhumanist. Um, I think that's a bit of a charged term. I think, um, I think when we look into the future, we're already melding with technology in different ways. And there's ones that are sort of used in standard medicine. It might be a heart implant or a pacemaker. Uh, and then there's the thought of how do we take technologies to augment our brains or our bodies. That's more on the transhumanist side. And um, I think it's important to sort of look at technology from how we can use it today for health and medicine and that separate that from the augmentation side of the equation. I think a byproduct, I'm trained as an oncologist, a cancer doctor, and so I'm certainly interested in ways to extend our not just our lifespan, but we want a good health span. You don't want to live to be 150 years old but not able to think or walk or, or, or have be you know, interactive. So I think it's more important to think about how do we take folks in their 80s and 90s to 100 to still be active, contributing, and vibrant. And many of the technologies that are emerging are going to bring this generation to that age level. Uh, I don't think super longevity necessarily needs to be the goal. Um, but if we're more proactive earlier in our lives, we don't smoke, we know our genetics, we work on our diet and other elements, that can be probably the best sort of drug in terms of achieving our own personal uh, longevity. Well, we know simple things uh, like 30 minutes of exercise a day is the best drug to prevent you know, depression, cancer, other things. And now there's you know, all these wearable technologies that can give an individual insight and ownership of their own data and information and choose to share that with their doctor at times. And because we know behavior change is hard, I can tell you a hundred times, eat, eat less and exercise more, you may never do that. But if I prescribe you an app and a device, maybe you go, Dr. Kraft's watching, or my mom's watching, or Twitter is watching. You might change your behaviors enough that over months and years, your activity and change give significant benefit to your health and longevity.
Our biology is very programmed to senescence and aging. And there are many folks looking at aging, including Google now has spun out a company called Calico. There's another company that Craig Venter, the, one of the first to sequence the genome called Human Longevity. They're leveraging some of this new big data, personal genomics. They're looking at, for example, the genes of folks who've lived to 120 or more, super centergenarians. What are the genetics for that? The challenge is why I might be able to replace your liver, your heart, or your kidney. The brain is still the final frontier, and most folks when they're getting over age 100 are having significant cognitive issues. So I think to get to 1,000, we need to uh, not only stand our sort of cardiac physiology, but really understand neuroscience in, in much more powerful ways. We're at the early stages now with diseases like Alzheimer's of being able to detect the disease 10 or 20 years before it shows up, which may give us an opportunity to use drugs or brain games or other elements to, to stave off that progression. So not 1,000, but I'm, I think kids born today can certainly live to 110, 120, all depending also on how they behave earlier in their life. Our behaviors are more impactful than our genetics in terms of our longevity and, and, and risk factors. The question being, you know, is this the end of the doctor as, as God, right? You know, I think we're in the era now, moving pretty quickly, where you are the God of your own care. You're going to own your healthcare data. You're going to have, you know, with help from Dr. Google and Dr. Siri and other things, get some earlier insights. And the physician's role will change. They'll help manage some of this information and help guide you in the right direction. Still might need to do procedures. But because so much of medicine is recognizing patterns, integrating data, now that there's an explosion of data and information, you need the doctor combined with, a, with a, uh, IBM Watson and the human touch. So I think the physician of the future will be looking a bit different, still needs to know their anatomy and their basic science, but blend that with information technology, mobile apps, um, new ways of doing uh, integrating information to, to be much more proactive and continuous about healthcare as opposed to where we are now, which is very reactive and intermittent. So if I would say, if I was to summarize the, where the future of medicine is going, we're, we're today in a sick care system, not a healthcare system. And with the emergence of mobile and sensors and big data and omics, we can shift from being intermittent and reactive to being more proactive and continuous. And that can make a huge difference individually and for the lives of our society and countries. Mm -hmm.